With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us here. As you can see by our decoration, as I'm sure you already know, it is Veterans Day, and we are, of course, glad that you chose to make a part of your Veterans Day listening to this program, whether you're joining us via YouTube Live or Facebook Live or Twitch or Twitter or however else you may be joining us. We certainly appreciate you being a part of the program and being here with us. We appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate that you enjoy watching tactics where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. So thank you so much for being on the program. It is, of course, Veterans Day, and that means there's a lot going on because, as you all know, the whole reason that we do this show is because I have a desire to talk to people about things that are really important. And I see chiefest among them freedom, liberty, the Constitution, and of course the Word of God, and our freedoms allow me to do the last one because of all the other ones. And of course with veterans, that is something that would not be possible. To be clear here, when I think about our veterans, people sometimes come up to me and, and thank me for things that I've done, just like people go up and, and thank veterans for their service. But I think the vast overwhelming majority of people that say that, and uh, I of course understand that what I'm doing is not nearly as important as what they do. In my case, and I love what I do, I really do, and I see what I'm doing as being beneficial. I hope that by conveying some truths to you, trying to get the facts to you and, and help people understand the Constitution, the foundations of this country, our moral imperatives to preserve liberty and why it's good for us as individuals and good for society as a whole. When you do that, ultimately, even though I see what I'm doing as being something that is positive for the, the, the country and I wouldn't continue to do it if I didn't think it made a difference, ultimately none of that matters without the veterans. I get that it takes different working parts to the country to make it work, but the piddly little service that I do is nothing compared to what they give up, what they have done for this country. I mean, when I go to work and when I do my service as it is for the country, look around. I'm in a super nice studio. It's air conditioned. I mean, for goodness sake, it's next to my bedroom. I don't even have to leave the house to do my show anymore. And when I think about those guys that they don't just leave the house to go to work, some of them are deployed for six, nine months, sometimes years at a time, having to be away from their family, sacrificing things like the birth of their own children, you know, the first time their son rides a bike, the first time their daughter has a dance recital. That's the kind of stuff they're giving up. Compared to that, what I give up is nothing. Uh, I mean, getting on the air for an hour and a half a day and uh, doing some prep work, yeah, it's difficult sometimes, and I get that I have a talent, and I'm very blessed, and, and it's a good thing that my father has given me the ability to do that, but it's it's not the same as leaving your family for months on end and doing a job where you're risking your own life. That is a whole other level not even really worthy to be mentioned in the same level of speech is, is what I'm doing. And so, as somebody that is not a veteran, as somebody that did not serve, I like to recognize how much veterans have done and, and the fact that I am able to do this solely rests upon the fact that there are veterans, men and women out there, that are willing to sacrifice parts of their lives, even if they don't wind up giving the ultimate sacrifice or even if they don't wind up giving up like a limb or, or having PTSD or something like that, all of which are very, very high 
levels of sacrifice, even if you don't wind up doing any of that. I understand that were it not for our brave men and women in uniform, that I wouldn't be able to do this. Because let's face it, there's a good chance that there's a tyrant somewhere in the world that would have taken over America by now had it not been for them, and I probably wouldn't be allowed to speak my mind even on the street corner, much less over the internet like this. So when you do see a veteran, not just on Veterans Day, but any day, just walk up to him and say thank you. When you see somebody in uniform, when you see somebody that maybe is retired and, and wears one of those army hats or one of the other armed forces hats that, that tells you where they were and where they're stationed, just go up to them and thank them. Occasionally, you'll run into one that's, you know, not it doesn't necessarily mean a lot to them or they, they prefer not to have people thank them. That does happen, but the vast overwhelming majority of the ones that I've done it for, it means a lot to them. There's a couple of them that I've said that to that it means an awful lot to them. And as somebody that has family in the armed forces, in the form of my great-grandfather and also my grandfather, I can tell you it means something to them too. So... Just remember to do that. But here's the thing. Ultimately, I realize I'm in over my head. The truth is, I can't speak from a perspective that is incredibly meaningful on Veterans Day, not because I'm not a talented communicator, but primarily because I'm not a veteran. I can't speak to you from experience on what that's like. i, I I mean, I, I try to convey things that are true, and I try to use the experience that I've learned from being around other veterans, but ultimately, it's not the same as doing it yourself, and I realize that. And so because I am incredibly overwhelmed when it comes to that, because I understand that I'm completely out of my league, unlike my colleague Kevin Elkins, who actually did serve in Grenada, because that's something that I just do not have, it's an experience I cannot convey to people. I felt it may be appropriate to hear a few words from somebody that actually did it. Somebody that was a veteran in World War II and somebody that understood the sacrifice that that takes and ultimately gave his own life in service to his country. And that man, of course, was John F. Kennedy. So I'd like to go ahead and listen to a speech that he gave on Veterans Day 1961 and it's just incredibly impactful. I found it earlier today on the internet, and I, and I found it to be excellent. Now, I'm going to go ahead and warn you, the video quality is pretty lacking. And that's because back in the day, you didn't have a quality color video camera in everybody's pocket like we do now. And if it didn't wind up on CBS or NBC, if the speech wasn't televised over one of the broadcast networks... Your video quality was pretty poor. So we're going to go ahead and watch this, but it's really not the video that's impactful. It's the words and the meaning. The video accompanies it. And also, thank you to the YouTuber that, that put this together and put this on the internet for us. We appreciate it. Here's John F. Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Gavin, Mr. Gleason, members of the military forces, veterans, fellow Americans, today we are here to celebrate and to honor and to commemorate the dead and the living. The young men who in every war since this country began have given testimony to their loyalty to their country and their own great courage. I do not believe that any nation in the history of the world has buried its soldiers further from its native soil than we Americans, or buried them closer to the towns in which they grew up. We uh, celebrate uh, this Veterans Day for a very few minutes, a few seconds of silence, and then this country's life goes on. But I think it most appropriate that we recall on this occasion and on every other moment when we are faced with great responsibilities 
the contribution and the sacrifice which so many men and their families have made in order to permit this country to now occupy its present position of responsibility and freedom and in order to permit us to gather here together. Bruce Catton, after totaling the casualties which took place in the Battle of Antietam, not so very far from this cemetery, when he looked at statistics which showed that in the short space of a few minutes, whole regiments lost 50 to 75 percent of their numbers, then wrote that life perhaps isn't the most precious gift of all, that men died for the possession of a few feet of a cornfield or a rocky hill or for almost nothing at all. But in a very large ascent, they died that this country might permit it to go on and that it might permit it to be fulfilled, the great hopes of its founders. In a world tormented by tension and the possibilities of conflict, we meet in a quiet commemoration of an historic day of peace. In an age that threatens the survival of freedom, we join together to honor those who made our freedom possible. The resolution of the Congress which first proclaimed Armistice Day, described November 11, 1918, as the end of the most destructive, sanguinary, and far-reaching war in the history of human annals. That resolution expressed the hope that the First World War would be, in truth, the war to end all wars. It suggested that those men who had died had therefore not given their lives in vain. It is a tragic fact that these hopes have not been fulfilled, that wars still more destructive and still more sanguinary followed, that man's capacity to devise new ways of killing his fellow men has far outstripped his capacity to live in peace with his fellow men. Some might say, therefore, that this day has lost its meaning, that the shadow of the new and deadly weapons have robbed this day of its great value, that whatever name we now give to this day, whatever flags we fly or prayers we utter, it is too late to honor those who died before and too soon to promise the living an end to organized death. But let us not forget that November 11th, 1918, signified a beginning as well as an end. The purpose of all war, said Augustine, is peace. The First World War produced man's first great effort in recent times to solve by international cooperation the problems of war. That experiment continues in our present day, still imperfect, still short of its responsibility but it does offer a hope that someday nations can live in harmony. For our part, we shall achieve that peace only with patience and perseverance and courage. The patience and perseverance necessary to work with allies of diverse interests but common goals. The courage necessary over a long period of time to overcome an adversary skilled in the art of harassment and obstruction. There is no way to maintain the frontiers of freedom without cost and commitment and risk. There is no swift and easy path to peace in our generation. No man who witnessed the tragedy of the last war, no man who can imagine the unimaginable possibility of the next war, can advocate war out of irritability or frustration or impatience. But let no nation confuse our perseverance and patience with fear of war or unwillingness to meet our responsibilities. We cannot save ourselves by abandoning those who are associated with us or rejecting our responsibilities. 
In the end, the only way to maintain the peace is to be prepared in the final extreme to fight for our country and to mean it. As a nation, we have little capacity for deception. We can convince friend and foe alike that we are in earnest about the defense of freedom only if we are in earnest. And I can assure the world that we are. This cemetery was first established 97 years ago. In this hill were first buried men who died in an earlier war, a savage war here in our own country. 99 years ago today, the men in gray were retiring from Antietam, where thousands of their comrades had fallen between dawn and dusk in one terrible day. And the men in blue were moving towards Fredericksburg, where thousands would soon, soon lie by a stone wall in heroic and sometimes miserable death. It was a cruel moment in our nation's history. But these memories, sad and proud, these quiet grounds, this cemetery, and others like it all around the world, remind us with pride of our obligation and our opportunity. On this Veterans Day of 1961, on this day of remembrance, let us pray in the name of those who have fallen in this country's war, and most especially who have fallen in the First World War and in the Second World War, that there will be no veterans of any further war, not because all shall have perished, but because all shall have learned to live together in peace. And to the dead here, in this cemetery, we say they are the race. They are the race immortal, whose beams make broad the common light of day. Though time may dim, though death has barred their portal, these we salute, which nameless passed away. Okay, so that's President Kennedy's powerful speech on Veterans Day, 1961. And... I believe that it speaks for itself, so I'm not going to do a ton of commentary here, but one thing that I did want to mention, because I think that this was the central theme to the speech and the thing that jumped out at me the most, is that it is a desire for peace, but a willingness to fight. There was a line in there that I think really sort of jumps out at you, and it is that the way that we will preserve peace is that we ultimately have to be willing to fight. In other words, what Kennedy is saying is, even though we love peace, and we want peace, and peace is the end goal to every just war, as he just pointed out, ultimately, if we are unwilling to fight a war, peace will not be capable, we will not be capable of finding peace. We will not be able to preserve liberty if we are not willing to fight. And that's one of the things that I wanted to point out is that that's really what our veterans are, aren't they? They are a symbol of our willingness to fight. That even in peacetime, even when there's nothing, you know, presumably in the world that's going on, even though ultimately there's always going to be at least some people in the world that despise freedom and want to enslave other people. Uh, th that's been true throughout all of human history. I imagine it's always going to be true. I would love the vision that JFK just pointed out there to come true, a time where there are no veterans, not because there are none willing to fight, but because a uh, man has learned to live in peace. I'd love that, but I don't think it's going to happen. The history of the human race is one of conflict. And so because of that, that's really perhaps the most important thing that our veterans do is that they are a symbol to the rest of the world. That if you are a threat to liberty, if you are a threat to our way of life, we stand willing and able to fight, to defend freedom, 
and to bring down America's enemies wherever they may hide. Another thing that Kennedy pointed out was that you'd be hard-pressed to find another nation in history that has buried more of their dead in other nations than us. Now, there have been nations throughout all of human history where people from one nation have been buried somewhere abroad because they fought in a conflict in a land not their own. But normally, the reason for that was conquest. There are American veterans all over the world buried in places like France and Germany and tiny islands scattered across the Pacific and in Korea and in Vietnam that were there because there was a national interest for America, sure. I think that that's accurate to say. But they were also liberating people of another country, people that were not their own while they were there. And I think that that speaks to the goodness of America. It speaks to the honor that we still have. And our veterans are always the first ones in when that comes into question. We have spilled more blood for other nations than any other country. And I think that's ultimately because wherever freedom is threatened, there is an expectation that America will respond. I don't want to be the world's police officers, and I would bet that the vast majority of our veterans don't either. I mean, goodness knows they have the most motivation to not want to be the world's police officers. But the fact that everywhere in the world, when there are bad guys that are wanting to harm or torture or bring some other kind of tyranny to other people, the fact that every single one of them, when they do that, has to think, I wonder how the Americans are going to respond to this. That's a good thing. That they have to worry about, is America going to come down on us because we are doing terrible things and we are trying to enslave people? Are there going to be Americans that help? I'm glad that that fear is there. I'm glad they have to ask that question. That's something that our veterans should be commended for. And I think that that comes to the, the more important part of why we do what we do. And another line that Kennedy said in there was, we're, to paraphrase, we're really bad at deceiving people. And so the only way that we can convince the rest of the world that when we take some kind of military action, we're doing so in the best interest of the world, we're doing so to preserve liberty, the only way to do it is to be sincere. The only way to do it is to not lie. Because if we don't do that, then people will see through us. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that if we do make that decision, that it is done only and exclusively to preserve our freedom. And that's why we have to be so incredibly cautious when we do decide to send American troops into a foreign land. I think the best example of why our veterans are so different, so special, and the reason that Americans love them so much, because you have to remember that in America, our military is the instrument of our liberation, not our oppression. Let's be honest, in most countries, and even in countries where that may no longer be the case now, for the vast majority of their history, the military was a force not only to be a threat to their nation's enemies, but also to the people in their nation as well. That's something that's never been true in America. Because let's look at, you know, England, for example. It's true that England's armies exist to act as a threat and a deterrent from people doing things that would harm the national interest of England. That is true. But for the vast majority of its history, they were also there to curtail and act as a kind of shackle on the people from harm harming the monarch. That's something that's never been true in America. Because our soldiers take an oath to uphold not a person, not a monarchy or a crown, but our Constitution. 
a constitution that was made by the people and for the people. That's the difference. There was an amazing story of a young man, well, he's not young anymore, obviously, but he was a young man when this happened to him, a guy named Dieter, and he is a German, natural-born German citizen. He's an American now. But back then, he was a young boy. I think he was about six or seven at the time that World War II was going on. And the contrast that he brought up here was so powerful because it, it so illustrates why our veterans are different from everybody else. He said that when they got word that the Americans are coming, they started celebrating. Now you think about it. He's a German citizen in World War II. Why would they be celebrating the Americans coming? That doesn't make any sense. Except it does. You see, he and his mother and grandmother were just as oppressed by the Nazis as the people that were not German, as the people in the nations that they had invaded. They were scrounging for food, not having enough to eat, literally digging through garbage every day to try to find enough to keep himself alive. And they were only given a ration of bread every single day to survive. And he said, there were an awful lot of days where my mom or grandma just went without so that they could give more to me. And he said that when he and all his friends heard the Americans were coming, they started celebrating because they were afraid the Russians were going to come. They were afraid that the Russians were going to invade them from the other side. And when that happened, Oh, they didn't want that to happen, because Russia was Germans in, uh, Germany's enemy then, that it was after they had switched sides. He said when the Russian soldiers came in, they stole things, they raped women, they took food, they took supplies. When they walked out of the German towns that they had invaded, they were actually a lot worse off than they were even before. And that's saying something because of how badly they were treated under Nazism. But when he heard the Americans were coming, they were going to bring supplies, relief, aid. They were going to heal some people that had been wounded or, or people that were sick. He said the first American that he met gave him a chocolate bar, which he ate and immediately threw up because of how hungry he was. His stomach just rejected it because it was so rich. See, that's the difference in America's military and everybody else's. Even foreign nationals, people that are not American citizens, that are oppressed and having their liberties taken away from them, they cheer when they hear the Americans are coming. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a minute. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post, head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Transdenominational Community Church and Coffee House in Nevado, California. And now for a reading from the SJW Bible. Today's reading will be from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 2 through 10. And a centurion slave was sick and about to die. When he had heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus was triggered upon hearing this and said, None of the good things he has done matter because he is a slave owner, and we must never admit that anyone that ever owns slaves is capable of doing anything good. Furthermore, instead of asking me for help, you should have passed universal health care by now so that he could receive treatment for free. Then Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, 
And I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, this man is engaged in systematic oppression. He is clearly engaging in wage slavery by controlling the means of production to exploit the labor of those around him. Then Jesus gathered up a mob and protested on the centurion's lawn all night long with torches and signs reading, Down with the Patriarchy, terrifying him and his family. We never really found out what happened to the centurion slave. Wow. So inspiring. Thank you for listening to this reading of the SJW Bible. And remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. Hey everybody, and welcome back. There was a lot of national news coverage of the state of Alabama this week. And a lot of it happened to revolve around the Alabama LSU game, for obvious reasons. And so uh, we will discuss exactly what happened there, because President Trump, of course, was in attendance. And it's very atypical for me not being a sports show to cover a sporting event in this much detail, but I'm going to. I'm not going to talk about the game as much uh, just on its surface, but before we get into the... Uh, before we get into some of the weeds here, I wanted to uh, just give my big takeaway from this. This is a meme that was posted by a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, so it's for those of you who are listening on the terrestrial signal. Remember when I said I'd make America great again? And it's a picture of Trump. It says, Bama lost. You're welcome. So... <laughs> I know I'm an Auburn fan. You you know I've got to you know take a jab at Bama whenever I can. But anyway, Trump going to Tuscaloosa, of course, and Alabama losing that big game. There were a lot of political side narratives going on because the president cannot go anywhere without it being a major political story and in this media a major controversy as well. Not just a news story, but one that's controversial and edgy. And unfortunately, this is true, and a lot of it really isn't the media's fault this time. One such thing that brought up, and I want to give major, major props to this guy, even though he and I don't agree on much and are on different sides of the aisle, you may remember Walt Maddox. Walt Maddox is the guy who ran for governor against our current governor, Kay Ivey. He's a Democrat. Trump, of course, being a Republican. Well, a lot of people are expecting Walt Maddox because he does have some pretty deep-seated policy disagreements with the president on how the country should be run. They were getting a statement from him, and to his credit, Walt Maddox said this, Regardless of party, any time a president comes, it's an American visit and as an American. I'm glad he's coming to our city. I look forward to making sure that he has a great visit to Tuscaloosa, even in the midst of probably the most important college game all season. Now, there's something at the end of there that I want to point out. First of all, he says, I, I want him to have a great visit, um, even in the midst of probably the most important college football game of all season. So here's the thing. He's basically saying, as mayor, I have a responsibility to prepare for the president coming. But let's be honest, it's not as important as the LSU Bama game, <laughs> which, I mean, come on, in this state, like the only thing more popular than Trump is Alabama football. And so Walt well, Maddox has a point. He's got to give the people what they want. Uh, that, that was secondary to preparing for the LSU Bama game. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, this goes back to one of the big maxims that I say at the beginning of every show, and it's because it is something that I believe is true and that largely America has forgotten. Disagreement isn't hate. Walt Maddox disagrees with a lot of things that President Trump says. I know because I've interviewed Walt Maddox. I've met the man. He and I get, got, got into it a few times on some different issues. I don't agree with everything Trump thinks. I don't agree with everything Walt Maddox thinks. And Walt Maddox and Donald Trump are pretty far apart on the political spectrum, I would guess. I think they're a lot closer than people would think, but the point is, you know, they've got some pretty deep-seated policy differences, and I think that's fair to say. The man was the Democrat nominee for his party in the last governor race. So, 
it's not that he dis he doesn't disagree with Trump, and he makes that clear in his statement. He's just saying this is an American president. It's an American visit, and the people in Tuscaloosa are Americans. That's the most important thing. See, that is a model for what America should be. I'm not saying you don't disagree with a person. I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place to have the debate. But we treat each other like brothers and neighbors and fellow countrymen. That's not that hard to do. And major props to Walt Maddox for doing this. And I said at the time, because you know that I interviewed him, uh, and it, that interview made the media rounds and was picked apart just like everything else. I don't like Walt Maddox's policies on a lot of things. He's a smart guy, and he's a good guy. He's an upstanding gentleman. Now, maybe we find out later that, you know, the guy was pulling a Robert Bentley and sleeping with a member of his staff, and then I'll have to recant that last statement. I don't know. But from everything that I've seen of the man so far, he is a patriot. He views himself as an American first. And he doesn't just assume that because he has some disagreements with people that he can't be cordial to them and treat them as though they're important. I mean, heck, the fact that the man was willing to come on my show shows, in my opinion, a great deal of character in wanting to be able to reach out to people that disagree with you. And let's be honest, being a Democrat in the state of Alabama, yeah, well, you know, he's surrounded by people that disagree with him a lot. That's not a bad thing. The idea that because we disagree with one another, that we have to hate one another, that we have to be not only... Uh, openly ridiculing, but impolite and hateful. That's just not true. And Walt Maddox, the mayor of Tuscaloosa, giving a master class in how to treat those whom you disagree with politically. I'm sure if, if Walt Maddox and got challenged to a debate with Trump, he would debate some policy issues with him. And it would probably be very heated doesn't mean he has to hate the man. doesn't mean Trump has to hate him. That's something that we should all be striving for. Now, here's a clip of Donald Trump being introduced at the game to thunderous applause. It's spliced together thanks to our friends at CBS 17 that covered this. And uh, you just get a, a sense of the reaction here at the Bama LSU game. So you can see there, that's after they announced that Trump's at the game. Hey, and that's Bradley Byrne over there. Old Representative Bradley Byrne snuck his way into the picture. Pretty sure that's him. Yeah, so there you go. Thunderous applause. Super loud. Everybody at the Bama game's excited. All right, so there you go. You get an idea of, of how everything went down. President Trump there at the Bama LSU game. Ultimately, I think this is one of the main reasons that President Trump was elected in the first place. The guy speaks the language of his tribe. People understand him. When he talks, he sounds like somebody that they would talk to about politics, either at church or... Well, maybe not at church with Trump's mouth, but, uh, uh, you know, in a bar or at their house or with their family at Thanksgiving. Trump talks about politics that way. There's some ways in which that's good. There's some ways in which that's bad, but I'm not going to break it down right now. The point is, a lot of people related to Trump because of that. And the fact that Trump is a guy that goes to a college football game and has fun at it. And he, when they play the anthem... He's super enthusiastic about it. And the thing is, with President Obama, that's something that we didn't have a lot of. 
with President Obama, there was a large portion, about half of this country, that felt like our own president hated us. And there's pretty good evidence to back that up. I mean, you look at not even getting into some of the scandals like him actually targeting Americans with the IRS trying to go after them because he politically disagreed with them. But like, you just look at the way that he talked. He was constantly going on these European apologies tours and talking about how America is basically the source of every bad thing that's ever happened in the world. He constantly referred to Americans as racist and systematically racist. He didn't sometimes overtly say it. Sometimes he did. But he would always suggest it. He suggested that, for example, Black Lives Matter were justified in a lot of ways. He tried to downplay a, a lot of the, the actions and the heroics of police officers, sometimes even at their own funeral for the five Dallas police officers. I mean, when it comes to, to other things, like saying that essentially American exceptionalism isn't a thing, every country thinks they're exceptional, America's really nothing special. He said that people bitterly cling to their gods and their guns and degrading the foundation of our very nation, constantly belittling our founding and our founding fathers and our constitution and talking about how messed up it is and how it needs to be changed and updated. And you also have to remember that he was constantly saying that we need to change our history and traditions and our culture. Basically, I want to fundamentally transform, to use his words, every aspect about it. Well, when you hear something like that, it's no wonder that about half of America thought, this guy hates us. He doesn't even really seem to like being an American. And so regardless of the policy differences, which are significant, regardless of the actual you know, legislation that's gone through that Trump approved and Obama didn't and vice versa, regardless of how the actual policies and lawmaking process has changed, I think the main reason that an awful lot of people voted for Trump is because he was the one that was most enthusiastically American. I mean, he's rah-rah flag constitution, the American military is the greatest thing ever, um, and it, part of that is because the president is the exaggerator in chief. I mean, he's constantly saying things that are the best, the biggest, the greatest. That's who the man is. But that was something that was appealing to a group of people that had seen a president that by all you know counts that they could see hated them, didn't like the country. And you can see why that is so refreshing. Look, Trump has a lot of flaws. And I make it a point to point them out as often as possible because that's my job. I'm a political commentator. He's the president. I'm supposed to be critical of him. That's what I'm supposed to do. When he screws up, I have to point it out. Otherwise, I'm basically just a, a communication arm for the Trump presidency. And there are broadcasters that are like that. But ultimately, one thing that I've never been able to be critical of him for, the man's a patriot. He loves this country. He thinks that America is the best place in the world to, to live. I mean, there's just nothing that the man doesn't love about this country, as far as I can tell. Now, um, he's fiery. He's critical of some of the people that live in the country, but he loves the country. And you know what? I could have said exactly the same thing, maybe not in the, the over-the-top way that Trump does things, but I could say the exact same thing about George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton. I just played a clip from John F. Kennedy. Frankly, I even think you could say that about somebody I really dislike, Lyndon Baines Johnson. You could certainly say it about Jimmy Carter. So it's not even a Republican-Democrat thing. I think a lot of Americans just wanted a president that was very pro-America and that that came across in the way that he talked to people. That's something that comes across when you're talking about Trump. It doesn't necessarily come across when you're talking about not only Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, but the vast majority of the Democrat pool. I mean, Andrew Yang is a notable exception, and Tulsi Gabbard is probably the most patriotic one of the bunch. But you get past them, and you kind of get the feeling they don't really like America very much. And so, when it comes down to that, I really do think that Trump, for all his flaws, is a very enthusiastic patriot, and people especially people in the state of Alabama, really relate to that. And I think that's part of the reason that you saw that. Now, 
uh, we'll go to one other tweet that was kind of critical of or trying to take a stab at the state of Alabama. So this is some rando on Twitter, but it came across uh, my Twitter feed. So Trump finally found a stadium full of people who won't boo him. Okay, someone's never been to a Trump rally. But anyway, in a state that ranks 50th in education, 46th in health care, 45th in employment, where 17.4% of the population lives below the poverty line, only 3.4% of the population are immigrants. All right, so there's a couple of things here that I want to point out. First of all, um, it's a complete red herring fallacy to say that because some people like something, well, they're terrible people and that shouldn't mean anything. Second of all, I've always found the like crowd reception thing to be a dumb measure for any politician. And I've said that when Trump was trying to artificially boost his uh, numbers for his inauguration and pretend that they were bigger than President Obama's, things like that. It's dumb when Trump does it. It's dumb when people on the left try to do it to hurt Trump. It's just a stupid argument to have, which is the reason I'm not going to get too far into it. But the way that he was critical of the state of Alabama, there's a couple things. First of all, when you're looking at your stats, his stats are just frankly wrong in a lot of ways. Or they're either wrong or misleading. For example, when he says, well, there's so many people living below the poverty line, we well, have to remember that poverty line is set for the nation, and Alabama is one of the lower-income states. But it is also one of the cheapest states to live in. And you've got, right now, two of the fastest-growing cities and city regions, in other words, the, the um, metropolitan area kind of surrounding the city. So not the city proper, but the areas around the cities. We have two of the fastest growing areas in the country, in the Auburn Opelika area and in the Huntsville area. People are flooding into those areas. And part of the reason for that is because you do have a low cost, a, a low cost of living, and a pretty good income in those cities. It's a growing city for a reason. There's a really good standard of life that you can achieve there. And by the way, when he's talking about unemployment, we've actually hit record low unemployment over the past two years. A couple of times, we have been smashing economic records in the state of Alabama. Now, our education, granted, you've got us there. It, it has a lot of room for improvement. It's still not terrible. It's not the way that he's portraying it. But, you know, it, granted, leaves a lot of room for improvement. Still shouldn't have anything to do with that. But here's another thing that I found really strange in his argument. Basically, what he's saying is, well, there's these, these little poor people, these riffraff down there that are cheering the president on. Well, if that's the case that you're making, uh, wouldn't that make the case that Trump is actually doing something for them? Like, if you're trying to, to make the case that Alabama is some backwater place where there's a whole bunch of poor people, and I don't think that it, that it is. I mean, there's you know a lot of nuance contained in that, and I could break down some of the statistics if you wanted to. But ultimately, the, the overall overarching point here is if that's really the case, why wouldn't those people approving him be actually a sign in his favor? Like, if you have a person that's a champion of the people, well, the people that support him would be the people that theoretically would be the ones that most benefit from having that person in power. So if it really is this backwater cesspool where there's just not a lot of economic growth going on, wouldn't it make a lot of sense for them to support a guy that has really sound economic policies? See, the reason that this argument falls apart and the reason that, because it's one of these entitled white liberals that looks down their nose at other people and goes, oh, isn't that quaint? The peasants are cheering for this man. Ah, that's what's going on here. It's condescending and rude, and he's looking down his nose at people because they happen to disagree with him. That's ultimately all it does. And there were other liberals making this case, too. I just happened to pull this one out because there was a visual example of it. I saw people talking about this all weekend. There were a bunch of liberals talking about how silly it is that these backwater hicks that live in Alabama and come from Louisiana are cheering for the president. Here's the thing. If we're going to compare people that support one political person or the other. And keep in mind, I didn't vote for Trump. I don't consider myself a Trump supporter. But let's compare. Let's look at people in rural Alabama 
or Tennessee or Florida or Georgia or Mississippi or Texas. Let's compare those people to the people that are living in Chicago, New York, L.A. Because if that's the comparison, I take the country people every freaking time without even having to think about it. When you, th when you think about people living in big cities, they're rude, they're obnoxious, and if you're looking at crime rates, they are incredibly high compared to people living out in Slap Out and Wetumpka and Prattville, Marbury, Verbena. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I'll take those people every single time. So don't try to make this comparison of, well, look at the people that are supporting them, because if you're looking at rat-infested, crime-infested cities like Baltimore and compare that to a community like we have here in Alabama, like Prattville, oh yeah, I don't even have to think about it. Prattville wins every freaking time. But that's just kind of the uh, state of affairs that we're in. Now, there was one other big headline that came out of Trump coming to Alabama, and it's a really strange one, but I have to point it out because I think a lot of people are approaching this story incorrectly. Now, I get that my opinion is going to make a lot of people unhappy, but, I'm, you know, so what? <laughs> I, hopefully you come to this show to hear a perspective that you hadn't thought of, not just because you want to hear somebody that agrees with everything that you already think. So just hear me out on this, contemplate whether I'm right or wrong, and then make a decision yourself. If you disagree, you disagree, fine. Put that in the comment section. I'd lo love to have that conversation with you. But there was a Trump supporter that popped the big baby Trump balloon with a knife. So if you didn't see this thing, there was a a, a big balloon and it's in the shape of uh, a baby, but the baby like has Trump's head. So it's a giant balloon that mocks the president. It, it's made the media rounds. I think it even went to London one time when he was, it may have been actually made over there. I'm not sure. Cause I think that was its first appearance, but anyway, this thing's made the rounds and there were a whole bunch of people that brought it to the Bama LSU game and a Trump supporter came by and popped it with a, a knife or like a box cutter or something. Uh, anyway, slashed it open. The balloon doesn't work anymore. All right. First of all, in this story, there are no good guys. Everybody involved is a moron. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, making a balloon mocking the president is childish and unproductive, yes. That's absolutely true. I don't think that this balloon is a productive form of free speech. It is protected under free speech, but I don't think it's a particularly good or smart free speech because it makes exactly one statement, which is, I hate Trump and want to belittle him. Is that saying anything about his economic policy? No. Is it saying anything about his policy even when it comes to things like border security? No. Is it saying anything about his foreign policy? No. All it's saying is, hey, Trump's a baby. Ha ha ha. Okay, you're an idiot. If that's the best you've got, you've got nothing. So I don't think that the people coming together with the, the Trump baby balloon are doing anything productive or good for the country. I think that they have a stupid message and they should be ashamed of themselves. Though I will say, it is good to see that Democrat voters, you know, the rank-and-file people, like, you know, wasting money on useless crap just as much as the leaders of their party. So I guess at least they're on the same page in that sense. But here's the thing. Protesting. Protesting is not a crime. Yes, it is dumb speech, but dumb speech is still free speech. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing from a legal perspective. It may be dumb, it may be unwise, it may not be something that furthers the political narrative in this country to a good place. It may even be something, as I believe, that is actually ultimately bad, but it's still something that is protected under free speech. Destroying a person's property is not, and that's what this guy that slashed the balloon did. How is this any different? than the Antifa thugs that go around stealing people's MAGA hats and burning them. How is it different? It's one side putting on something that expresses their political opinion, and people go around and remove it and destroy it because they disagree with it. If that's the best you've got, then your message sucks. If you are so intolerant of somebody disagreeing with you that you have to destroy their po property just to make a statement, you're the little person, you're the unthinking person. And this guy, 
is no different than the Antifa thugs that destroy people's property to make a political statement. He's in the same boat as they are. And I know that there are a lot of people that supported it, that were cheering him on, which was ridiculous, but that's the way that it is. You think about that video we saw and we covered about the guy at Whataburger who threw the drink in the guy's face and stole his hat. Now, that one's a little different because there was assault and then theft, but the theft of the hat is no different than just straight up destroying the Trump balloon. And so if you're supporting this guy, I really want you to think about that because I actually saw some people defending this guy and saying that, oh, it's a good thing that he slashed the Trump balloon just because they don't like the Trump balloon. And there were even people that put up a GoFundMe account to pay for the guy's legal fees and to pay his bail and all this other stuff. Don't do that. You're associating with this guy. And what he is doing is not helping. In fact, all it is doing is playing into the stereotype of the angry Trump supporter that can't handle a difference of opinion, and so he has to destroy the balloon because he's too unthinking and not smart enough to come up with a political debate himself, which, by the way, is accurate. But it feeds that stereotype and helps people on the left believe that all people that support Trump are that way. Because here's the thing. Is the Trump balloon changing anybody's mind? Any of you out there that support Trump, have you ever looked at the Trump balloon and go, you know what, these guys are actually making some good points. Maybe I should reconsider my support of the president. No, because it it's not designed to do that. All that is designed to do is to be a big billboard to everybody saying, no, we hate Trump. That's all it does. And you know what? Slashing that balloon, the only thing that it says is, well, we hate you for hating Trump. That's stupid too. You're not having a productive conversation. You're not solving any problems. You're having a disagreement over a cult of personality, one that hates the personality, one that loves the personality, but you're not doing anything productive. Now, I will say this, though. Even though I agree and stand by everything that I just said, I do not think that the they got what they deserved is appropriate, but I will say this. How did they not see this coming? You're going to a state where Trump is more popular than in any other state in the country and a state where just about everybody that you pass has a pocket knife. Like, how did they not see that bringing a giant balloon mocking the president was kind of a dumb idea in this state? Again, not justifying it, not saying it was okay, not saying that the guy shouldn't face legal penalties, which he already has, in response to that. He should be, you know... Anything that comes with destruction of property, legally, he should be tried just like anybody else. He should be treated just like anybody else. But what's hilarious in this, it's like, did the people that were bringing the balloon not think, well, this is Alabama, and Trump has an insanely high approval rating here, and everyone we've passed has a pocket knife. Maybe we should reconsider bringing the Trump balloon. <laughs> I'm not saying that it makes it okay, but it's kind of like, if you get mugged, I feel a lot of sympathy for you. If you get mugged when you were walking down a dark alley at 2.30 in the morning in a rough side of town with 20s hanging out of your pocket, I still feel sorry for you, but it, there's a certain point where I'm like, but yeah, that was kind of dumb. And that's kind of where I am with these guys too. Road scholars, these two people aren't. The guy slashing the balloon and the guys bringing the balloon. These are not intelligent people. Anyway, so Hoyt Hutchinson, who's the guy who wound up slashing the balloon, he called into Rick and Bubba, which appears on this fine station, News Radio 1440, and he said, and this is a quote directly from him, I watch the news every night. I watch Fox News every night. Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity are my favorite two anchors. By the way, Sean Hannity also appears on News Radio 1440. I see this stuff going on and out, uh, on out west and up north and all other places. I get so mad about people not taking a stand. The left wants to use religion against you like you shouldn't act like this and stuff. Okay, again, this guy's not a road scholar here. But I'll tell you this. The devil knows the Bible as good as we do. Rick Burgess, he responds, This was your turning of the temple tables? Hutchinson replies, Yes. It comes to a point when you gotta take a stand. We don't have two parties anymore. We have good versus evil. All right. First of all, you ain't Jesus, and Trump is not God. 
Because if you're going to apply that analogy here, and I know that Rick was the one that applied it, not him, but if you're going to apply that analogy, that puts this Yahoo over there, that puts him in the role of Jesus, who has righteous indignation for people making his father's house, the temple at Jerusalem, a den of thieves, where they were extorting people that were trying to worship God. We're making that the same thing now? Really? Because if that's the case, then the offended, in the case of the temple God, the one who is being offended by there being some kind of blasphemy against him, is President Trump. Trump is not a god. Trump has done some really good things. He's been a much better president than I ever thought he would. I can say some nice things about Trump. He's still not God, and never will be, and is not anywhere close to it. You don't put somebody, a human being, in that role. You just don't. And Rick Burgess ought to know better. I mean, he knows the scripture reasonably well based on some of the things that I've heard, and, and I consider him, you know, somebody that he's he's a colleague, he's on my radio station, he's a, a fellow Cumulus employee. I'm calling him out. It was something that was in the moment. I don't know that he really thought it through, but come on, man. You're putting Trump in the role of God there. That's a bad place to be. And I'm not saying that, you know, he was reasoning this out or anything. It was probably an impulsive moment. But come on, you, you just don't do that. That's terrible. But another thing, too, bad behavior does not justify bad behavior. When these people are doing something that is wrong and you disagree with, that doesn't justify you breaking the law to make a statement against you. When Jesus overturned the tables in the temple... Whose house was that? It was his house. It was his father's house. It was supposed to be a house of prayer, and these people were violating that. These people were not doing anything wrong. Okay, they weren't doing anything legally wrong. They're doing something morally wrong. But they weren't doing anything legally wrong. And the idea that you're going to step up and break the law to make a political statement against them, that's just absurd. So. That being said, there is actually something in that interview that I thought was extremely good, and I want you to hear this. Hutchinson replied a little bit later, When you got one party that says it's okay to kill babies, and by the way, this is the first time I've ever seen a liberal get mad about chopping up a baby. Okay, I'm sorry, that's a killer burn. I mean, that is spot on. And I think that it says a lot about the left, that you had weeping and gnashing of teeth that you had an awful lot of people on the left, whether you're talking about uh, on the different cable shows, the Progress Network, I saw different stories about this going on all weekend and talking about uh, how upset they were that people did this and how it shows that Trump supporters are dangerous and violent and all this other crazy stuff. And I'm sitting there like, okay, you're really upset that this Trump baby balloon got cut but you're not worried about the millions upon millions of babies that have been slaughtered in their mother's wombs, real babies, not made out of rubber like this balloon is. That's really where your priorities are? Seriously? I think a very apt analogy here would be the story of Jonah. Because if you'll remember at the tail end of the story of Jonah after Nineveh had repented and God said, I will not destroy them, that he sends a little tree to cover up Jonah and, and so that he can have shade when he's sitting up there on a hill watching the city of Nineveh. And Jonah is eagerly anticipating God destroy the city and kill all of the people in Nineveh. And when the tree dies, he starts crying and praying that, that it was better for him to have never been born than for this tree to have died. And God just looks at him like, and I know that you can't read inflection into the Bible, I, I get that, and I, I'm not trying to add unto, but I just imagine God's response to this being like, Jonah, you've got to be kidding me, right? Seriously, you're upset about the dumb tree, but you're not concerned about the tens of thousands of people in Nineveh. You're not concerned about their lives, their families, their connections with one another, their connection to me but you're crying about a dumb tree. Jonah, you're supposed to be a prophet. And that's exactly what's going on here. 
you've got the left in this massive uproar about how dangerous Trump supporters are and how upset they are about the stupid baby balloon. But there's millions of babies being killed every single year by abortion. And we're just supposed to ignore that? That they're not concerned about. It really does show where their priorities lie and how corrupt and wicked and vile their morals and worldview has become. That takes somebody that has been completely deadened inside, that their conscience has been trained to not observe evil. And I think that that's exactly where we are. So, yeah, don't agree with this guy at all. Think that he's really stupid and deserves everything that he gets when it comes to penalties of the law. But that was a sick burn. And the fact that these people don't see that, the fact that these people don't see the irony in being upset over this stupid balloon, but not being upset about the millions of lives that have been stolen from this world by the horrific sin that is abortion, I think that's very telling about where the left's priorities are. All right, let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today... Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Philippians. But to understand where we're going with this, you have to know that Paul is trying to give some practical wisdom here. He's trying to give some practical wisdom to uh, those at, at Philippi and, and just trying to give them some idea of how to live like Jesus. Because that's really kind of the crux of this letter, and really, in a in a sense, every letter that Paul sends, but... We all know that sometimes Paul gets a little philosophical, and right now he's just trying to give them some very practical things to do. He's like, here's some things that you need to do in your normal life, some things that you need to practice to be able to live the way that Jesus wants us to live. So we'll go ahead and look, and this is Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Whoa, um, wrong verse here. Give me a second. There we go. Sorry. Justin on the fly. Anything can happen on a live web show. All right, so Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So if we understand this to be Paul trying to give the Philippians some advice on how they're supposed to live who they're supposed to be. First of all, we know that we're supposed to do things without grumbling or disputing. That's a hard thing to do sometimes, especially when it comes to something that we may not completely understand in the moment, that maybe we'll do it, but we're going to fuss about it the whole time. Do you really think God wants to see that out of us? Like, if we're going to church, but we're doing it because we feel like we have to and we don't really want to go and we'd kind of rather sleep in or we'd kind of rather catch the NFL game or whatever it is, whatever's distracting us from that, that we do it with grumbling and disputing or if we're giving to people or donating some time, volunteering, helping people out, but we're really fussing about it, it's too early or it's too hot out here. If there's one thing that you learn from the children of Israel wandering around in the desert is that God does not like whining. And he's compassionate. He worries about our needs. He worries about things that, that we may want from him. And he tries to listen to our request whenever he can. But ultimately, he doesn't like whiners. And just like a, a real parent, you know, somebody that is having to deal with a difficult child you'd almost rather them just not even do what you tell them to do as opposed to doing it but fussing about it the entire time. That was something that was difficult for me because I know that this is hard to believe, but I tended to argue a lot as a child. 
I know that's a, a shock to everyone, but that really is the way that it was. And so the crux of this is that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. Why is that above reproach thing so important? Because God wants us to live in such a way that if anyone were to criticize us, it would be abundantly clear to any fair-minded person that the person that is accusing us of some kind of wrongdoing, they're the ones that are actually in the wrong. You see, God wants his people to have a good reputation with those around him. He understands that, you know, the world didn't love him, and so it's not going to love us. He understands that there are always going to be scoffers and people that want to tear us down because we follow God. He understands all that, and Paul understands that. Some of our, our best writings to attest to that come from Paul. And this is a man who was persecuted a great deal in his lifetime. But the good people that are fair-minded and are actually looking for the truth, they're going to see that persecution. They're going to see people accuse us of doing nothing wrong. And they are going. that is going to change a person's heart and mind. They're going to look at that and go, this guy's not bothering anyone. This guy's not doing anything wrong. And this actually kind of goes back to the story that we were talking about just a second ago. The guy slashing open the balloon and the people that are flying the balloon. That doesn't change a person's heart and mind. They can see the vitriol, the animosity towards the other side, and they just don't want to be a part of it. A fair-minded, open-minded individual would look at somebody like in the 1960s. People marching peacefully and having fire hoses turned on them and still not attacking even when they were being attacked. They look at that and see, there might be something to this Christian thing. Look at the They're not even fighting back. When you have an opportunity to retaliate or to do to an enemy as they've done to you, and you don't, you take a step back, you turn the other cheek, that gets people's attention. That gets people listening to you. That makes people think, there is something about that individual that is different, and I want to learn what it is. Yeah, some of them will go on to agree with you. Some of them will still walk away. But the point is, that gets your foot in the door. Behaving exactly like everybody else expects, retaliating whenever something bad happens to you, that doesn't do any good. And it's the unchristian way to, to think about it. Jesus didn't even go after the very people that were murdering him while they were doing it. That's the kind of person that can change the world. And it's the kind of person that we should strive to be. If we live a life where we do the best that we can to be above reproach, to where even our accusers that are saying things about us, other people hear it and go, uh, I know that guy and he's not like that. I know that guy and say what you want to about him, but he's honest. Say what you want to him about him, but he is dedicated. Say what you want to about him, but he loves his family. He does his job. He's a good man or a good woman. You see, when that happens, people actually do start paying attention to the life that we're living. And that's why Paul ends this by saying, you'll be in the midst of a perverse generation, but you'll appear as lights of the world. See, Paul's not saying do this because other people are just, you should live a life above reproach because then everybody will like you. Then everybody will just be accepting of you and you won't have any problems. Paul's not saying that. He's saying this is a wicked and perverse and evil generation. And when people see you acting completely different from them, then all of a sudden you become a light in the world because light shines brightest in the dark. You don't really notice a flashlight when the lights are on. You notice a flashlight when all the lights are out. That's why you have a flashlight. And that's what Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to be a light in the world that when everybody's surrounded by darkness, they see all this hate, all this vitriol, all this infighting and bickering about nothing. And they see the person standing there and saying, no, this is stupid. And living a life that is truly above reproach, being moral, loving your family, being dedicated and honorable and honest, then all of a sudden the focus turns to you. And that is when we have an opportunity to teach people the gospel of Christ. It worked in Paul's day. It works now.
that advice that Paul gave the Philippians 2,000 years ago, it applies to us right now. And if we want to be lights amongst the world, we have to do the best that we can to live a life that is above reproach. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalrada Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.